There are so many different options for cybersecurity training, but not all of them are at an affordable price tag or accessible and approachable in the way that you like and you like to learn. So anti-siphon training associated with Black Hills Information Security and all of that family of companies all put together by John Strand have an incredible option called Pay What You Can. It's this whole approach to education and training and all this cybersecurity stuff that I for one love. It says, look, it, we're here to help you. Whether or not you're getting started in cybersecurity, you're wanting to improve your skills, or you're trying to train your team, anti-siphon training has a whole lot of awesome curriculum there. Now what I wanna do in this video is regardless of a price tag, I I want to showcase some of the free resources, like free exercises, free activities, free labs, things that you can play with without any cost for free for fun. But before I do, I would be remiss not to mention all of the incredible options that come from Anti-Siphon's training, whether or not it's live training or on-demand training, things that you want to catch a whole live webinar for, or just catch some videos and be able to take a look at it after the fact, whenever you want to learn. Tons of different courses on purple teaming, on enterprise forensics and response, from initial access, penetration testing, enterprise security, packet decoding, regular expressions, anything. And at the top of their website, there is this option for pay what you can training, where you can choose how much you you want to pay. A couple of these courses are an option for you. SOC core skills like Security Operations Center, Regular Expressions, Active Defense, and Cyber Deception. Let me click on uh, Getting Started in Security with Black Hills Information Security and the MITRE ATT&CK framework. With a Pay What You Can course, you can gain access to their Cyber Range, which is really a uh, meta CTF. It's a giant capture the flag that you can do whatever the heck you want to do with it. But this is one of their premier courses. It says, look, anyone that's new to information security, anyone that wants to get into cyber security, just fire it up. Of course, John Strand is a head honcho leading this thing. One incredible fella, a seriously great friend, and I respect the hell out of everything that he does. And they have one upcoming course April 17th through the 20th, so if you want to register for that live training, you can go ahead and click on it here. And look, this is the form that you can fill out, cruise through it, but it is pay what you can. Look, if you want to pay $25 or like $500, you can absolutely do it, run through it. Here are all these options, whatever you need to fill out to purchase this thing. And I realize, hey, John, what the heck? You said pay what you can, but here are all these options with dollar signs, $25, $50, $100. Check it out. If you look at this for tuition assistance, please click here, click on this thing, new form, all that goes away. He says, would you like to start another registration? Yes, absolutely. Scroll down, uh, fill out all this stuff, but now that option for price tag is gone. So let me fill this out super duper quick. Now take a look, all of this, zero dollars. You can jump in for free. Let me hit next. Nothing else left to do here. We can submit and we've got that free pay what you can training. There we go, registered, didn't have to pay a cent, didn't have to enter any credit card information, didn't have to do anything, just slap in some of the info and I've got a confirmation number and I'm ready to rock. Oh, they got a nice little countdown, cool. This is gonna be coming up pretty quick. All right, now what we can dive into in this video is getting our hands on some of the virtual machines and labs and exercises that are included in these pay what you can courses that John Strand, bless his heart, generous as all get out, is willing to offer and give to the world completely for free. But if you wanna take the most out of all this, you should work with the virtual machine that has been prepared and provided for you. They do suggest, hey, you can use this in VMware Workstation, or you can use VirtualBox, of course, which is free, a little bit more accessible if you aren't using VMware Workstation Player. Any of these options, all in all, you have to download the virtual machine itself. It's included in a 7-zip archive, and they stress, look, if you're taking the class, if you're getting into the fun and action here, you should probably download this, like, right now. It takes a little bit to download. It's a big, big file. So click the go button. I'm gonna go ahead and save it with my virtual machines. I'll hit save there and I'll start to see this thing download. They do give you instructions as to how you might go ahead and extract this. If you don't have 7-zip, usually in the class that they do live trainings for, we'll hand that out in a USB drive. But hey, you should be able to kind of pull this thing down, extract it as needed. The username and password for all the virtual machines are just ADHD, lowercase no quotes. And of course, they have a Discord server. If you have any questions, need support, it's all yours. Hey, quick note, this is like a 16 gigabyte file to download, so seriously, download it now. I'll include the link in the video description too. Okay, so my virtual machine has finished downloading. I'm gonna go ahead and right click on this and I'll use 7-zip to extract it to this directory here. That should go ahead and carve this out. Okay, and now that that is finishing up, I'll go ahead and open this in VMware Workstation. I'm gonna end up using VMware Workstation. However, of course, you can use VMware Player, you could use VirtualBox, whatever fits your fancy here. Inside of VMware Workstation, I'm gonna go ahead and hit Open or Control U on the keyboard. I'll go ahead and navigate to those virtual machines and where I went ahead and stored this, and I'll open up that VMX file. Now I can open this, and that should go ahead and spawn in the virtual machine. I'm gonna rename this, I'm just gonna change the settings here, go to the Options tab, and I'll call this John Strand 
PWYC for pay what you can. Hit OK on that and now we can turn this thing on. If it asks whether or not you moved it or copied it, I'm gonna go ahead and click I copied it. And it might whine and complain that virtualization is not supported on this platform. Just for a little bit of background knowledge, the virtual machine for the pay what you can courses and all of John Strand's lectures use some virtualization within virtualization. In fact, it's using WSL or that Windows subsystem for Linux where you have Linux as a virtual machine inside of your Windows virtual machine. It gets weird, but in most cases you will need to probably, if you run into this issue, reboot and change your BIOS settings. You honestly can just Google, like, hey, your computer's manufacturer, and then BIOS enable virtualization. Within virtualization, there are a couple weird oddities for every single make and manufacturer, but trust me, you can track it down, and we should be able to go ahead and boot this machine without an issue. Looks like, in my case, I need to do that, so I'm going to reboot and change those settings, and I'll be right back. Alrighty, back in action. Let's see if I can go ahead and turn this sucker on. Fingers crossed. Alright, success. Looks like it's booting without an issue. Looking good. Hey, just for your awareness, I am using an ASRock or ASRock Creator machine. Uh, I had to boot into my BIOS and I turned on SVM mode, made sure that was enabled. I also had to go into the advanced configuration setting CPU stuff to turn SVIO, SRIOV, whatever setting. I don't know computers and turn that on. Also, still wouldn't work. I asked Uncle Google, brought me to Reddit's, all holy Reddit's. Hey, they've got all the answers. Uh, looks like this helped me out here. BCD, edit the command to set hypervisor launch type off. And then with the optional features of Windows, I would turn off Windows subsystem for Linux and another reboot. That ended up working for me. So hey, kudos and credit to all those folks. I'll link that in the description if that helps you just as well. With that, we are booted up to our machine. Let me go ahead and hit ADHD as the password and we know for the user ADHD and we can log right in. All right, I amped up the display settings here so hopefully you can see this a little bit better and we do have a couple uh, shortcuts on the desktop for Zap. You have Nmap, you have Docker, Windows Terminal and we should be able to actually open up Windows Terminal and then choose, you know, I also want an Ubuntu machine because again, this is using the Windows subsystem for Linux so you've actually got Linux as a virtual machine inside of your Windows virtual machine and we can do a whole lot of super cool fun stuff with that. Uh, let me go ahead and close this out and I'll bring us to the labs here. If I double click on that shortcut, you'll note that we'll open up our web browser. And this is where John Strand in all his glory has shared all of these labs that you can go through for free, literally for free. And these are the ones that you might be able to dig into for the introduction to SOC, Security Operations Center, and all those skills that you might gain. Look at all these things. There are so many super duper cool ones. And in just a GitHub repository, this is nice and easy and that you can literally just sort of copy and paste. Like you can hey, press the I believe button, see it happen, watch the magic unfold before your very eyes. So let me go through and showcase this. But seriously, you can go to this within your web browser right now if you wanted to. The intro labs just right here is exactly what you want to get to. Uh, one thing to note though, is that they do have a batch script to be able to pull and clone all this stuff. That is worthwhile to do. Uh, so let me go ahead and make sure that we pull and update all of the labs to the latest versions. If you minimize your web browser and you go open up your file explorer, they should be present if you move into the C directory here. We can go ahead and explore what's on the file system. They do have a tools directory here, along with the Atomic Red team, a bunch of others. You do have this lab update script here, but there's actually inside of the intro lab folder, a lab update, pull a batch script, which should be a little bit better for us to use. Let me go ahead and double click on that. You can see it will go ahead and pull down all of the latest labs with Git and then we're good. We're good to go. And one other thing that uh, John Strand recommends is if you actually make sure that Windows updates is off, just for the sake of, hey, things running smoothly in class, you don't want to install these updates. If you want to go ahead and actually make sure within the advanced options, all of these Microsoft Windows updates are off, don't let it do it. If you want to be super hardcore, you can go into the Windows services and like seriously just go kill and stop the Windows update service. Let me see, do I have that down here? Yeah, Windows update, let me just right click, stop. We would also go into properties here and make that uh, disabled. There we go. We set that startup type to disable to hit apply and okay. Now that all of that boilerplate stuff is done, hey, you know, let's go ahead and do a lab. Let me fire up the Edge browser that I had where we were looking at the intro labs navigation that we started with and we could dive into the intro to SOC class and probably take a look at, hey, just the very first lab for us, the Linux CLI. With Linux command line. Bear in mind, hey, this is meant to be a beginner friendly lab. So we're going to be going to some basics here, but that's okay. For folks that are just getting into this, this might be really, really cool to get some lay of the land for some of the Linux file system and some of the shady shenanigans that can happen with malware, reverse shells, backdoors, all that stuff. 
So in this lab, we'll be looking at a backdoor through the lens of the Linux CLI, or the Linux command line interface. We'll be using a large number of different basic commands to get a better understanding of what a backdoor is and what it does. We'll be using three different Ubuntu terminals. The first will be where we, 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 we. The first will be where we run the back door. The second will be where we connect to it. The third is where we'll be running our analysis. So let's get started by opening up a terminal as an administrator. I'm gonna hit the Windows key. I'll type in terminal and I'll hit control shift and enter to open that up as an admin. There we go. Now that that's open, let me get back to it. And it says, look, if you want to open up an Ubuntu command prompt, that is where we'll use a little drop down. We can do that just as well. Here's Ubuntu, another control shift three if you're a keyboard junkie. Now we wanna become root, we wanna become the super user. So what we will do is sudo or super user do, su to switch user and then a hyphen to denote, look, I don't wanna be any specific user to switch into. I just wanna become root, the absolute administrator, the ruler of all the Linux domain. Let me hit sudo su hyphen and now you need to enter the password. Again, that is ADHD. If you aren't familiar with Linux, it's just not gonna display what you're typing. The keys don't show up, even with like asterisks or stars or whatever. You just have to trust that you're typing correctly. Hopefully it's okay to do, it's only four letters. I'll enter and now you can see I am root. Note the prompt has changed with a little hashtag, no longer than the dollar sign. We've got our Octothorpe here and that denotes that we are root. If I run the who am I command that validates that. Now we have a root prompt. We want to do this because we're going to have a backdoor running as root and then a connection from a different user account on the system. First, we need to create an FIFO backpipe or a first in first out sort of different file. Everything in Linux is a file. Even those weird network devices or whatever, I don't know, manual human interface devices like your mouse and keyboard, all that can be treated and understood as a file within Linux. So let me go ahead and create this to make nod, whatever, backpipe as a type of device here, and then P. P is the pipe that we want to refer to, but backpipe will be the name of the file. Let's go ahead and copy this. Again, super duper easy. Switch back, I'll paste that in. You can use the right click on your keyboard. Now if I LS, you can see there is our backpipe file. Looks like we had another honeyport.sh file in the current directory. That's okay, all we care about is our backpipe. And now we can start the backdoor. What we do is some special syntax here, where we denote we're gonna run the bash command. We're gonna take input from a file descriptor. Now this is a weird thing. You can think of a couple of different ways that you interact with your computer through different streams, right? You have a input stream, like what you type on the keyboard or how you move your mouse, and that is a standard input stream. That has a numerical identifier, zero. Just what you're typing in, hey, consider it zero as just a number. You could have standard output, like the stuff that's displayed on your computer screen, info that returns back to you when you run commands in the command line, that's standard output, and that number is one. There's also standard error, which is like number two, that's another output stream, but specifically designated for errors and stuff that goes wrong. You don't have to worry about it right now, but just for the press the I believe button, zero is our input and one is our output. So take a look at what we're doing here. We're running bash with standard input being read in with like a little less than redirector from our back pipe piped into to take some of the standard output and standard input into another application, netcat. Netcat is going to listen on port 2222 or quad two, where standard output, you can see that number one there, is gonna go funneled back into the back pipe. So kind of weird, right? But bear with me, that is going to act as our back door. That's just the syntax, the semantic sugar. Let me go ahead and copy this one more time. I'll paste it into our command prompt here. Once I hit enter, now there's no output. Nothing is happening. But on port 22222, a lot of tutus, we are going to have a back door or sort of like a bind shell. Like it's literally waiting and listening for connections on port 2222 that it will actually allow you to enter commands and run code. The description explains this just as well, but now we wanna open up another Ubuntu terminal. That is where we'll go ahead and connect to work with our back door. Open up another Ubuntu terminal. They recommend that you use ifconfig. I'm gonna say, look, hey, ifconfig is deprecated. It's not what you should be using in today's modern day and age. We wanna try and use the command ip. Now ip with other parameters or arguments or subcommands, you could use adder to list addresses. And in fact, you wanna show them with another subcommand, ip adder show. Now that will enter and display our same interface, eth0, the important one here, with the inet or IP address 
actual address, 172.18.111.250. That is our host. That's our IP address to our Linux machine. So I'm going to go ahead and copy that. And now it suggests that we try to connect to our back door. Let's use netcat to connect to that IP address on port 22222. Remember, your IP address will be different as ours is. We end in, what, 250? Yeah. So let me go ahead and netcat to that IP address at that port 2222. Hit enter. And now there's nothing happening on the screen, but if I actually type in the who am I command, just as I did earlier, remember that root output is what we saw a moment ago. I can ls to list stuff in the current directory. I can say pwd to see, hey, what is my present working directory? I can run the id command. I can go ahead and touch a file. Now, if I list that out, there's that file because we are interacting with this machine because of our backdoor and through our backdoor. They go ahead and validate it the exact same way and you have a simple Linux backdoor as root. Now we can open up another Ubuntu terminal and start our analysis. We have one where we created the backdoor, we have one that connects to it, and now a third one for analysis. Let me hop back over there, create a new Ubuntu terminal, and let's again run as root. So sudo su, switch user to the hyphen, enter the password, and now we're root. Now we want to be root because looking at network connections and process information system wide requires that root access. Basically, it's hard to do your job as a SOC analyst without this administrator privilege. So let's start by looking at network connections with LSOF or list open files. When you list open files, you can use the TAC I flag to look at open internet connections. When you use TAC P, you're actually asking LSOF, this command, don't try and guess what service and port it's on, just give us the port number. I just wanna see what port is actually being open for this open file. So let's use LSOF, TAC I, TAC capital P, and now take a look. We actually have TCP service running on any interface, that star, on 2222, the port number for our back door. You can see that it is listening and that is a little bit peculiar. We can see netcat is the command running that. Even the process ID and the user that invoked it, the file descriptor, all the stuff that could be super helpful for our analysis. Because especially that process ID number might allow us to dig into it a little bit further. If you didn't want to use the capital P argument to list open ports, you can use the lowercase p switch to denote anything associated with that process ID. In our case, we know that that is 231. So let's use LSOF, tech lowercase p, 231. Now we'll drill down into specifically that netcat command. And take a look. We can actually see this is the current working directory that it's in. It's in slash root. We can see the file that it might be working with, that FIFO or first in, first out, backpipe. Note that that's specifically the file that it's using. And the IPv4 address, the information about the port that it's listening on, or even the connection that it's coming from. That's super duper helpful. Now, other things that you might be able to do are look at these other running processes. We know this netcat process is running, but what else is being ran and invoked? So you can use the PS command to be able to do that. We'll use the AUX switch, A for all processes, U sorted by user and X to include the processes using a teletype terminal, like a real interactive shell. Let me go ahead and run PS AUX and check it out. There is our netcat command that we saw just a moment ago, and there is our root running on that process ID 231 for our netcat listener. I think we can actually use PS elf, and that will try to list these out in a sort of like tree-like structure where you can see sort of a branch, one child process after the parent process. Note, hey, this is the original sudo su command that we ran, and starting to invoke bash, and then start to listen on port 222. Two. Lots of twos. Now, finally, let's go navigate into the proc directory. This is something super specific and special to Linux in that it's a directory inside of Linux that does not exist on the physical hard drive. Like it's not in your file system, but it is something in memory. It's something that Linux uses and allows us to see data associated with various processes that are running, that are active in memory. This can be super duper useful because it allows us to dig into that memory to see what might be happening. If you change directory into slash proc and the process ID, remember ours is 231. Now inside of this directory, we have a whole lot of different interesting stuff to dig into. 
you actually have the executable that's kind of being ran within memory. You actually have the current working directory as even like a sim link. If I try to do ls tac la, we could actually see what that cwd refers to. It's pointing towards that slash root directory where we know that this thing started from. And the executable is even going to netcat. It knows that it's slash bin slash netcat dot open BSD. Just one of the netcat variants. You could dig into the memory. You could see what things are mapped. You can see what files have been accessed. You can even see the command line that it was invoked with. Tons of cool stuff inside of the proc directory. But they recommend inside this lab, even running the strings command to take a look at what you might be able to pull out of the running executable. Let's run strings dot slash exe. And if I scroll through this, you could even see like, the help output, like literally the usage to run the netcat command. And now you've got a pretty clear indicator, like a good smoking gun that, look, if you put on your blinders and you didn't know that you would, were manually running this back door, say you switch perspective to the analyst to look through this, now you know exactly how this backdoor was created because you were able to find and carve out and literally dig through using the proc file system and everything that you've learned on the Linux command line to note that's netcat. And that's how they crafted this executable and backdoor. And that is the very, very first lab that you could cruise through for free as part of the introduction to SOC or Security Operations Center course, all from John Strand and anti-siphon training and all this incredible pay what you can. If you really, really like want to make this thing free, like you can. It's, it's up to you wanting to take on that learning and want to go on this journey. So I hope that's kind of cool. I hope that's kind of fun. Look, this was just the tip of the iceberg and I was trying to speed run through the lab because this video is already long enough as it is setting up the virtual machine, getting into the class. I hope it's just cool and opens a whole new wide world for you to, to have things to play with, have things to learn from. Cruise through a couple of these labs. I hope I can make a couple more videos on this. And uh, I just love that, look, it's in, it's in GitHub. You can copy and paste. You can make this super duper easy and gain a whole lot of exposure to new tech, new technology, new software, new solutions to things that you might not have seen before. So uh, I hope that was fun. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please do all those YouTube algorithm things, like, comment, subscribe. And I've been talking way too fast for way too long. <laughs> I'll see you in the next video.